Hello, and welcome to Acme Science News Now. I am your host, Samuel Hansen, and I am here today uh, to talk to you about bacteria. Uh, you might not really think of bacteria as being uh, social organisms, but I now know that uh, they actually are, and I know that thanks to some research from my guest, Oleg Egoshin, about Myxococcus xanthus uh, and its behavior. So, uh, Professor uh, Egoshin, welcome to the show. Glad to be with you. I guess the, the very first question where we need to start here would be, what is uh, Myxococcus xanthus? So, Myxococcus xanthus is a soil dwelling, so it lives in the soil, rod-shaped, so it's kind of cylindrical shaped bacteria, and it looks like it's a single cell like million other bacteria. But what's really cool about it is, as you mentioned, it's really social, they work together, they act together, they move together as a group, and as a result of some signaling within that group, they can form various patterns, and that's what's really cool about this bacteria. So how how is this uh, how is is this myxobacteria different from the other bacteria that are usually studied in a biology lab? So let me give you a little bit of my historical sort of philosophical uh, difference, and then I'll get to the details. One of the things that by bacteria that we are currently studying as model organism were selected because they all could grow very well in the shaker in the flask or as a single cell organisms in the petri dish. So when we were selecting which strains we could study, we could study all different kinds and we didn't have any preferences unless there was a like disease specific or something. So people actually were selecting things that grow well on its own, didn't stuck to the test tube walls and were, were okay. And as a result, the strains of E. coli and other model bacteria that were selected are really boring from a social standpoint because we were selecting against that. Because, I mean, if they were very social, they would tend to stick together, they would clamp our test tubes, and we would not uh, s select them to study. On the other hand, the Myxococcus xanthus was actually selected because a, the, some of the patterns it formed, you can see with your naked eyes. And when they were initially saw uh, somewhere in the beginning of 20th century or in the end of the 19th century, People saw that they saw some kind of fungi or even some sort of mushroom type of structure. You can see those patterns, and that's why it was selected. And then at some point, it became a model organism for social behavior, for social maturity. And now we are actually coming back, and we understand that in nature, all the bacteria, even the very close relatives of those that we study, for are living in communities. They're not by themselves. They actually tend to stick to surfaces. They tend to secrete a lot of mucus, a lot of slime, and they, they, this holds them together and uh, makes cells adhere to one another. And Mixo is a model bacteria for many of those properties. So, on the other hand, if you just compare Mixo with other bacteria, I mean, it's similar shape to E. coli, maybe a little bit longer aspect ratio. And aspect ratio is important because the long and thin aspect ratio make them align to one another as they bump to one another. Uh, e. coli can swim in 3D. Mixer can't swim in 3D. It can only crawl on the surfaces. It's called gliding maturity. So it does it rather slowly. So E. coli swims a body length per second. Mixer swims a body length per minute. So, and by being small and by being slow, they should doesn't have much physical means to exchange diffusible signals. So that's why we think it communicates with cell-cell contact. As you mentioned, there are these patterns and, and structures that Mixo makes. What uh, specific pattern were you looking at in this research? So in, the, in this particular paper, we looked at traveling waves that those bacteria are self-organizing. And you can see those traveling waves with any kind of microscope, even very, actually they work very nice in the very old microscope because you can see the whole field in there. And those are cell density waves, so the crests, which look darker on the microscope and some of those images, they are high density bacteria, maybe multi-layer or very tightly packed single layer. 
and the thralls have very few cells, so they're relatively uh, and not so dense. And then you have trains of waves traveling in one direction and trains of waves traveling in the other direction, and they look like they pass through one another without interference, but it appears, and we found in this paper and actually in some of the previous research on there, that they actually reflect from one another. So even though they look like they pass through one another, they reflect from one another. What did, what did you find about these waves? How is it that uh, this bacteria is able to travel in this way? So we asked two questions. The first of all is how those waves are coming about. And second of all, why would bacteria form those waves? So the, the first question, we actually answered, had some kind of model that explained this back then, 10 years ago when I was actually a PhD student, and my first encounter with biology was the model of death waves. Now we know much more about things, so we actually modified that model to be consistent with the la latest biological knowledge. The way those waves come about is that when bacteria pass and make side-to-side -side contact, we decide to have contact with, with certain probability they can signal one another and cell that gets this signal will switch its polarity and instead of going right, left to right, start going right to left. Not by making a U-turn, but more like a train by making a head its tail and tail its head. So this ingredient, together with some minimal time that have to pass before you can reverse again, is actually necessary and sufficient to within the framework of the model to make them form the waves. So that, 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 that's the first question. And the second question is, we know that those waves are mainly formed when those bacteria are on top of their prey. They're predatory bacteria, they're happy to, uh, to eat any other unicellular organism. We, so far, almost anything we throw them, them they can eat. So the question is, how will those waves benefit this predata predatory activity? So what we find is that those interactions that produce waves help them to cover their prey faster. So when they are initially not on top of prey and then the front of the bacteria propagates and covers, the speed of this front is faster with those wave producing interactions. And that's actually quite clear because when the cells going outwards, there are no more mix ahead of it, so nothing signals, so you go there longer, then you turn around, go backwards, encounter the signal, and that makes you going backwards not so long as going forward, so you will propagate faster. However, once you completely cover your prey, and you're somewhere in the, in the middle of your colony, you're going back and forth, you get an equal amount of signal. So what will the waves do then? is to trap cells between two wave crests, so they will go back and forth, and like a, basically a collection of oscillators or clocks that are coupled together, each, each of them will be more precise than, uh, on the, or than they were on their own because of the coupling. So cells uh, will go back and forth, and they will uh, would be much less likely to leave this exact location uh, when they are coupled with the signaling. Uh, uh, as compared to the situation when they're not coupled. So what we saw is that the, those waves make cells motility much more periodic than it was originally made, and that means that it's basically going back and forth, will not leave, they will not leave the prey area as fast as they would otherwise do. So basically this signaling makes cells spread over their prey faster and then stay in over the prey for longer. And both of them kind of make sense evolutionary. And both of those predictions were actually tested in the experimental counterpart of this paper by uh, the group of Heidi Kaplan and a couple of her graduate students. They did test those predictions. And we get a very nice quantitative agreement with what the model predicts. You actually managed to just uh, bring all, all of this behavior down to just a, a small set of rules, I believe. What what were those rules specifically? So the two rules are, uh, the, 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 the two rules are, first of all, is cells uh, making side-to-side -side contact uh, can engage in a signal they want, 
and that signal and event can make one of the cells reverse. So this is rule number one. And second, after reversals, you will be deaf. You will not be sensitive to signal for a certain small amount of time, before, so you will not reverse again during that time frame. So those are two sort of biological ingredients, and on top of that, there are some sort of biophysical ingredients. As I told you, those cells are long and thin, so like pencils in the box, you put pencils in the box and random orientation, shake the box, they tend to align just because of their shape. The same way as those cells move, they tend to bump to, there is some side, head to side collisions, and that lead to alignment of the cells. So those three ingredients are sufficient to produce the waves. There, there are a couple of other ingredients that are needed to explain some other aspect of behavior. For example, uh, the cells can only also reverse on, on, their, on themselves, and we know that because we see that experimentally. So even without signal and cells that go outwards, at some point it will reverse and start going backwards. So that, 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 that's, not, that, that's not necessary for waves per se, it's necessary to explain some other aspects of experimentally observed behavior. When you went into this, were you expecting uh, to be able to cull the behavior down to a, you know, only three ingredients, or were you expecting uh, to need more rules in order to get the same sort of behavior out of the bacteria? I'm a physicist by training, so I'm attracted by simplicity. So I was hoping we can narrow down to just a few very necessary ingredients. So th this iteration of the model is actually slightly more, even more simple in its basics than the original model that we had 10 years ago in, in, in there. The, the, uh, ten years ago, we had a model from the head-to-head -head collisions. Now it's side-to-side, -side, and head-to-head -head is not as robust as side-to-side. -side. You can imagine it's much less likely that bacteria will hit, uh, make pole-to-pole -pole contact with their shapes and stuff. So we had to have some sort of signal integrator. So you had to have several collisions that need to be accumulated, and the, and the end resulted from reversals. Now it's very simple. Just one simple collision is. Is, is enough. So that's a little bit surprising, but it was a pleasant surprise to me because I like the simplicity. Uh, do you think that uh, this research uh, may have any sort of implications to people outside of the, the group that are already researching Mixo? So th th there are multiple sides of things. First of all, this sort of side-to-side -side bacterial sensing one another signal we, we are not yet sure about the mechanism uh, exactly, but once we boil down to molecular mechanism, in a sense, we know the proteins, that may be a very useful tool for the synthetic biology, because, I mean, synthetic biology try to build unnatural things around of natural parts, so with that goal in mind, having a toolbox as complete as possible is a very good idea, and having a toolbox for cell-to-cell -to -cell sensing is definitely something that would be very, uh, very interesting. Yeah. The, the, the other side of things is basically the whole paradigm of this coupled experimental theoretical research in, in, a, in a sense, it, it can be adapted to other type of sort of self-organization behaviors and there are a bunch of them in other areas of science like uh, growing a human being out of a single cell, that's probably one of the most complicated self cell or self-organization behaviors in, in there, so it's more or less this kind of par paradigm of uh, re research might be helpful in, in, in those areas as well. Well, Oleg Igushin, thank you so much for coming on to Acme Science News Now. Thanks a lot for having me.